Buenos dias. Good morning. My name is Carlos Manchaca. I'm the president, the chair of the Committee on Immigration here at the New York City Council. Uh, before going any further, I want to welcome our council member, Peter Ku from Queens on the committee. Today, the Committee on Immigration will hold a hearing about the best practices for city agencies, courts, and law enforcement authorized to certify immigrant victims for U and T visas. Assistance and cooperation from immigrant communities is crucial to keeping not just our immigrant communities, but all New Yorkers safe. This is the Council's top priority. Unfortunately, the President's calls for local law enforcement entanglement with federal immigration enforcement undermines community policing efforts. To increase public safety, immigrant victims and witnesses must feel comfortable reporting crimes and working with law enforcement on all investigations. This is especially true of immigrants, especially women and children, who can be particularly vulnerable to crimes like human trafficking and domestic violence. That is why today we are considering proposed resolution 1097A and resolution 1637, which call on Congress to heed both of these calls. Today's hearing will give representatives from various certifying agencies the opportunity to highlight how immigrant victims can request U and T visa certifications. It will also allow advocates and New Yorkers to provide recommendations, ideas, issues, feedback, and point to the best practices. These recommendations will inform MOYA and city agencies as the new immigration task force explores ways to better support our immigrant victims. I would like to thank the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, as well as the representatives from all the other agencies here today who will be supporting any testimony or questions that we may have. I will also say that um, and this is for folks at home who might be listening to us today and wanting to get engaged in how we think about UNT visas. It's important to say that the UNT visas provide law enforcement officials with a valuable tool to promote immigrant cooperation with law enforcement to build trust. In order to apply for a U or T visa, the victim must obtain a certification from law enforcement verifying their victim status and helpfulness. Unfortunately, the visa's effectiveness is promoting immigrant cooperation. Unfortunately, the visa's effectiveness is in promoting immigrant cooperation is undermined by the inability or delay in getting the certification necessary to apply. In New York City, the local agencies that provide U visa certifications include the NYPD, the Administration for Children's Services, the NYC Law Department, and the NYC Commission on Human Rights. Additionally, criminal and family court judges, as well as all five district attorneys' offices, may sign U visa certifications. Only 10,000 U visas and 5,000 T visas may be issued each year nationwide. Due to these limits, waiting periods for these visas is at least two years. Clearly, Congress must act to increase to remove these caps. Additionally, Congress, Congress must soon introduce legislation to reauthorize Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act as relevant appropriations will expire in 2018. These are important facts to give out to our community who are more and more coming to us as a city agency, as a city, and asking for help. En español les quiero decir... La, oh, Dar la bienvenida y buenos días. Soy el miembro del Consejo Municipal, el presidente del Comité de Inmigración. Antes de continuar, aquí está Peter Ku, concejal de Queens. El Comité de Inmigración celebra ahora una audiencia pública de la tema Mejores Prácticas para Agencias de la Ciudad, Tribunales y los Cuerpos polici Policiales para certificar víctimas inmigrantes para visas de U y de T. So, with that, I want to uh, invite Moya to give their testimony as we begin. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you to Chairman Chaka and all the great work that you do, members of the committee, Council Member Ku. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Acting Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. In my testimony today on behalf of the administration, I will describe the work we have done to improve the city's U and T visa law enforcement certification processes and the measures we have undertaken across city agencies to expand public education about these programs. Programs, excuse me. I also have with me colleagues from other agencies involved in the area to address questions specific to their agency's work. Since 2014, the city has taken a number of steps to strengthen the U and T visa law enforcement certification process. Those efforts followed the mayor's pledge in the One New York Rising Together platform to address concerns with, about U visa certifications and T visa declarations by city agencies. The mayor pledged to work with the agencies to improve the speed of the certification processes and their issuance. The number of requests from immigrants for certifications has climbed significantly over the past several years, a trend attributable not to increased crime, but instead to increased awareness about the option for victims. The number of approvals has also increased dramatically, with this year on pace to be over 50% higher than the levels we saw in 2014. The importance of this work has been reinforced in the current moment. When changes in the federal immigration enforcement policies and priorities threaten to undermine immigrants' trust in the willingness to interact with local law enforcement. The U and T visa programs are crucial tools in local law enforcement and investigative agencies' ability to secure the cooperation and testimony of immigrant victims of crime. In 2014, administration officials created an interagency working group to spur agencies' collaboration on best practices, outreach, and public education, while also working together to ensure that the program's integrity of agency certification procedures is maintained. The working group is convened by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence and it includes the city's certifying agencies, the New York City Police Department, the Administration for Children's Services, the Commission on Human Rights, and the Law Department Family Court Division, as well as the five district attorney's offices. The certification process at the NYPD, the city agency that receives the largest volume of certification requests, has seen significant changes over the past several years. These changes reflect the NYPD's commitment to engendering cooperation between police and the immigrant community. Police Commissioner O'Neill has stated it is incumbent upon the men and women of the NYPD to maintain the trust and the confidence of all who depend on the services of the police department for their safety. In 2014, the NYPD increased the number of authorized certifying officials permitting the department to process a far larger number of certification requests. The NYPD further made major reforms to its procedures for accepting and evaluating certification requests via formal notice and comment rulemaking. Its U visa certification rule was promulgated in 2016 and the T visa rule in 2017. Among other things, these rules set guidelines for the department's processing of requests and establishing an appeals process within the agency's legal bureau to adjudicate challenges to denials. The NYPD has also ceased its prior practice of denying certification requests in cases where the alleged crime occurred outside of the statute of limitations for prosecution and performed a review of all such denials, resulting in the department deciding to reverse prior denials in some instances. ACS's certification program is an important aspect of the agency's commitment to enhancing the safety of children in homes that are free from domestic violence. ACS's program supports the ability of non-abusive parents to protect themselves and their children and helps families assess needed benefits and services. To this end, ACS has made improvements to the processes in the past few years. In June of 2014, ACS adopted new internal guidance on U visa certifications, including guidelines for the agency's certifying officials to ensure effective processing. 
In 2016, ACS issued its first T visa declaration and has worked to ensure that the legal and advocacy community is aware of the T visa option as well. The Law Department Family Court Division, which represents the government in certain juvenile justice matters, has generally seen a lower number of requests and therefore lower number of certifications performed. However, the Law Department has seen a consistent measurable increase in both requests and certifications over the past several years. The Commission on Human Rights, we're happy to say, began accepting U visa certification and T visa declaration requests in February of 2016, becoming the first local anti-discrimination agency in a major U.S. city to perform this function. The Commission's work in this area is therefore quite new, but has already been greeted with praise by legal providers and others. In addition to the work these four certifying agencies, the administration's interagency working group has allowed the city agencies the opportunity to develop more extensive collaboration with the five district attorney's offices on outreach and public education about the availability of U and T visas. The city certifying agencies have greatly expanded their U and T visa certification capacity and approvals over the past several years. Citywide, we went from 636 requests and 317 certifications in 2014 to 700 requests and 399 certifications in 2015 to 875 requests and 521 certifications in 2016 with 776 requests and about 347 certifications over the first eight months alone of 2017. So it's a series of numbers, but clearly demonstrates that increase I described earlier in my testimony. These facts bear out the success that the administration has been able to accomplish in this area. Outreach and public ed education have continued to be major areas of focus of the interagency working group and its member agencies. And there's been a wide array of awareness raising activities since 2014. Among the most powerful education measures was the creation of a centralized New York City government website with standardized information about how you can request U visa certifications and T visa declarations from each certifying agency and each DA's offices. This has enabled Moya staff and others to direct attorneys, social workers, advocates, and crime victims themselves to one resource that provides comprehensible information about how to proceed. Before we created this website, there was simply not one centralized tool to help immigrants and advocates find the information that they would need to pursue a certification. OCTV and Moya jointly produced public education materials specifically aimed at sharing information with victims of crime. The two agencies commissioners also published a joint op-ed earlier this year, in part in response to elevated fears in immigrant communities about hate crimes and immigration enforcement. OCDV performs regular educational trainings at its family justice centers in every borough about immigration remedies for victims of domestic violence and trafficking. Moya staff have shared information in a range of settings, including at community-based Know Your Rights Forum events, town halls, hosted by elected officials and others, as well as through public events as part of our annual Immigrant Heritage Week. Moya, OCTV, and MOCJ have also convened advocates who work on immigrants' rights and domestic violence issues to learn about the group's concerns and the population needs. In April of this year, NYPD and Moya held a continuing legal education program to educate attorneys in the private immigration bar about these issues. Additionally, NYPD personnel have met with service providers and advocates through the Borough Sexual Assault Task Forces. The administration has gone beyond our local work on this issue in advocating for improvements to the U and T visa programs where we have seen opportunities for them to better serve our immigrant residents and families. In 2014, Commissioner Agrawal wrote to USCIS, U.S. Customs and Immigration Enforcement, so, excuse me, service, to advocate for broadening the definition of certifying officials that would permit appointment of non-managerial staff 
um, arguing that such a change would provide law enforcement agencies with flexibility to authorize certifications by additional members of their staff whose duties may not include supervisory functions, but would otherwise be um, quite expert in being able to certify. USCIS has yet to adopt this proposal. While we maintain that this change should be adopted, the city certifying agencies, in particular, as I mentioned, the NYPD, have nevertheless expanded their certifying officials to broaden access as much as possible under the current federal regulations. In 2016, Commissioner Agarwal, along with USCIS Ombudsman, advocated with USCIS in favor of a policy to grant parole to U visa applicants and their derivatives who reside overseas. USCIS adopted this policy, we were happy to see, late last year, but President Trump's January 25th executive order on border security called for strict limits on federal immigration agencies' parole authority, indicating an apparent end to the U-Visa parole policy. In addition, Moya continues to be in touch with USCIS on issues relating to U and T visas and remains in contact with advocates and elected officials on these issues in order to identify opportunities for positive change or other necessary advocacy. The administration has made, as I said, significant changes across the city agencies to ensure that accurate information about U and T visas is shared with members of community and practitioners. These changes have also been aimed at ensuring that the certifying agency's protocols and practice procedures are effective, prompt, and result in fair determinations. The interagency working group continues to discuss a range of issues related to U and T visas and share best practices, and is monitoring changes in federal immigration policy that could affect U and T visa processes. In addition, the working group members will continue to collect and compile data to be reported publicly by Moya. This committee and the full council have recognized the importance of this aspect of our work in your passage of introduction 1568A just last week. The administration through this interagency working group and other means will continue its efforts across the agencies to build and protect trust between immigrants and local law enforcement officials including through public education on the UNT visa certification process. Thank you for allowing me to testify with you here today. Thank you, Commissioner. And we're here um, to have a, a kind of good conversation about some of the changes because we do want to acknowledge that there have been changes and advancements in, in this process, as complicated as it's been. And I guess what I want to do is, is maybe just go right into some of the specifics. Uh, we know that NYPD has made some, some changes already. How, uh, and everything's kind of alluding to increased access, more training. How are you actually evaluating that internally? How have you been evaluating that as Moya? Um, and is that evaluation the same as an NYPD at, at, at NYPD? Uh, yeah, well, I would, um, I would obviously invite my colleagues at NYPD to speak to their internal uh, uh, evaluations, if you will. What I'll say is we've very much valued the open line of communication through the interagency working group and less informally outside of that working group with all of the city certifying agencies. Part of what we've been able to do is look at sort of what the processes look like, look at what requests, um, sort of numbers of requests look like and, and denials and sort of be able to sort of maintain and monitor, if you will, that things are moving in the direction that we've all hoped that they would. I would emphasize that the determination on an individual case is obviously within that agency's discretion and purview and due to confidentiality concerns and reasons, Moya does not evaluate individual cases but leaves that expertise to the agencies themselves. And completely respecting the confidentiality, no doubt, uh, I still haven't necessarily heard more about, about the, the texture of the data that's coming out from your evaluation. So I'm, I'm hearing you are looking at efficiencies, you are looking at access. Um, but how have you, what is that concrete data about how is it working internally? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think what we've been able to look at is sort of 
number of certification requests received, right, um, the period of time in which things are pending, number of issued, denied, withdrawn, the appeals that have been filed um, through the agencies. We've been able to sort of monitor that, that data set, if you will, over the course of the last few years. Um, and based on that, kind of engage in conversation on uh, the processes themselves and where we think potentially other improvements could be or where public education needs to happen. What has that data told you? The data has said in part what I uh, testified to earlier, which is that we have expanded greatly uh, the number of certifications that have been issued. We've also shortened the time frames in which people are responded to. Um, we've looked at particular concerns um, that advocates and others have raised around uh, potential denials, be it at NYPD or others, and tried to address those concerns um, with changes in procedure or evaluation or minimally have an open conversation with folks about why certain decisions have been made. One aspect of that has resulted in having the appeals process, um, which allows folks to come back. Is that new? Yes. The appeals process? 2014. 2014? 2014. Okay. Yeah. But can we invite an NYPD official to speak to, and speak to this question about data and how, how we, we want as many specifics as possible, not individual casework, but how, how are you measuring increased access? What are the numbers? Are we, you know, the, the one piece that just kind of shoot out is um, we've had the number of U visa certification requests made to the NYPD has increased more than sevenfold in the last six years from 87 in 2011 to 713 in 2016. So, so we, we're, we're taking some data, but it'd be good to get some NYPD data about how, how the changes have impacted your ability uh, to respond to these new and dramatically increased uh, applications. And then also, I'll throw in on top of that, the NYPD, um, how, how are you addressing the concerns? Um, the OIG report that came out as well and how, 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 are you, how are you addressing some of those concerns that were in that report? My square man. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, my name is Susan Herman. I'm Deputy Commissioner of Collaborative Policing for okay. the NYPD. She's asking oh. if you want to swear yes. her in. You know what? I didn't do the oath. <laughs> it's okay. We'll right. skip it. I swear Where is I my mind this, this morning? <laughs> <laughs> So none of you are under oath. So we have to right. do this again. Are you okay? It's okay. So, well, we I'll have just make. Oh, hold on. Let me just say. Raise all of you. Raise your hand. You continue to tell the truth and nothing but the truth to this committee and the members here today. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, in 2014, as you said, we had 501 applications submitted. In 2016, 713, and as of the end of August in 2017, we have 651. We're on par for probably about 1,000 being submitted this year. So that's a tremendous increase within this um, last few years. Our process um, has gotten faster. We believe it's gotten fairer, and it's gotten completely transparent. We, on our own, before this working group even began, posted our process on our website. Our process used to take 30 to 60 days. We are now um, at 45 days or less, and that's, in fact, the rule that we have adopted, 45 days or less. So it's faster. It's fairer because we have created, again, on our own, a review process. And we don't know of another police department in the country that has a review process. So that's a big step in the direction of creating a fair process. We are completely transparent in that we have published our guidelines and our process on our website. We were the first agency in the city to do that. We are among, I think it, you would be hard pressed to find another police department that puts up as much detail about their process as we do. So it's fast, it's fair, it's transparent, and 
uh, we have also been and continue to be responsive to suggestions uh, that have been made along the way. The statute of limitations is a great example. We were denying based on the statute of limitations. We no longer are. Um, so the process has changed, and I think it reflects our desire to be as um, simple, fair, transparent as possible. We've also moved the place where people drop off their applications. They can drop them off in one police plaza, but that can be an intimidating place. You have to go through several levels of security to get in, and you now can drop it off there if you wish to, if that's convenient for you and your choice, or at the 7th Precinct. So I want to acknowledge that I think there's been incredible strides in this process and the real dedication from the entire administration, from Moya, working in partnership with all the city agencies have, have really kind of brought us to this point. And so fairer, more transparent, um, and, and quicker. Uh, and those are things that really uh, impact the lives of so many of mm -hmm. every single applicant's lives. It also brings more trust and ability for people to understand something that is incredibly not easy to understand. Those are all, those are all good things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I want to acknowledge that. Um, we're always trying to figure out how we, how we continue to make that better. So we're going to hear some ideas from advocates today, and I'm hoping that we can continue that conversation. Um, the, the OIG gave a report. Is there anything that kind of stuck out or, or, or stood out in that, in that report that has been a challenge for the NYPD? For for response or um, for response from I, that report. I think we we have a we're preparing our response and okay. we'll be issuing that shortly. When will you be issuing out that that kind of final response? Within whatever the time frame is that we okay. have. Okay. Ninety days. Well, I okay. We I was hoping you would share something, but we'll be ready when that when that response comes to continue that that mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that isn't as clear, um, and while the process has been kind of laid out on your website, again, thank you. Um, we, we're also trying to figure out who, who the actual agents are to certify. Um, that's, I think, a little so, bit. So U visas go to our DV unit, all U visa certification requests. Can, can you repeat that again? The D U visa unit? requests, U visa requests, go to our domestic violence unit, whether it is a domestic violence underlying crime or any kind of crime, because they have developed an expertise, so it just happens to go there. So they review all U visa requests. And T visa um, requests go to our trafficking unit, our vice unit. This kind of leads us to, to, to try to understand some of the, um, the, the kind of general data about uh, survivors of crime who have a criminal history and applications being denied to those survivors of crime and trying to understand what basis the NYPD has to reject an application and what guidelines are built around um, those applicants with criminal history. So we look at the entire context of a person's record, their entire record, and if, if we believe that there's a public safety risk um, we don't certify that person. But we're looking at a, the, a context, a whole record. We're not looking necessarily at a single event. Do you track data on how many? We do. How many, well, and the questions. We do. In, 27, in 2016, out of all of our denials, which were 127, 36 of them were denied for public safety reasons. Can I go deeper and um, ask, of the denials, how many of them, well, maybe this is a more large Venn diagram here, but of those who applied with some criminal history, how many of them were denied? So trying to, I'm trying to understand. I understand your question. Yeah. I, I cannot answer that. Okay, so we don't have that. Is that something that can be uh, provided? It'd be complicated because we'd be looking back at We'd be looking backwards. It would take some effort to do that, but we can look at that. Well, I'd like to ask um, that we can, if we can prepare that and, and uh, at, a, at a future How many date. had any criminal record at all? Well, the, the, the core uh, of this question is trying to understand, um, back to kind of a sense of transparency and looking at, at kind of future recommendations for 
either more transparency or just data um, to understand a little bit more about that public safety threat. Um, so help us understand that. I'm, I'm, I'm officially requesting that data. We'll, we'll put a letter together. But what, what I, would you, if you can tell us a little bit, how do you define public threat in this case where you we have rejected 36 based on public? Right. We look at the seriousness of what other, whatever crimes were committed. That's what we're And what is serious? There's a range of crimes. We certainly look at, but we do not rely exclusively on the 175 crimes that are the underlying crimes that be, can be included. Sometimes we have certified people who have committed one of those crimes, and sometimes we have not. It's an entire picture to try and determine. It's a discretionary process. It's hard to get very specific about exactly how to define that. Okay. Um, we'll come back to that. DAs, tell me a little bit about how you work with the DAs, because they're also involved in the criminal justice system and also part of this process as well. How, how, do you, how does the NYPD work with the district attorneys to, one, determine that question around public threat? So, okay. so when there's been an arrest in the case and the case has gone forward to a DA's office, we refer all of those cases to the DA's because we believe that the helpfulness requirement is a requirement for ongoing helpfulness. And we can't certify or have knowledge necessarily about that stage of the process. So when it's gone to the DA's office, we refer the case to them, as is typically the practice around the country. Tell us a little bit about the work that you do internally on addressing concerns from the public. So how does the outreach happen with NYPD? Um, what, how, can, how, do you impact, or how do you bring in constituencies uh, to understand the changes? You've done so many changes, and these changes kind of continue to, to come in. How, how do you evaluate? How do we get that input? input from communities and how do you define your constituency in this case? Uh, are you bringing in advocates? Are you talking to survivors of crime? So in, in my role as Deputy Commissioner of Collaborative Policing, I work with many interest groups, including many victim advocacy organizations and immigrant organizations. I personally meet with lots of groups. I have a quarterly victim advocate advisory committee. I participate in the working group that Moya and OCDV and Mache co-convene, and I hear input on a regular basis. I have um, oversight of the CVAP program that's now in two-thirds of our precincts where we have Safe Horizon victim advocates. So they're interacting with crime victims on a daily basis, and I get a lot of input into what their needs and concerns are. They, by the way, are trained in UNT visas and can talk to victims and do about uh, those processes. So it sounds like I you're also meet with council members. And, and council members. Right. <laughs> Got it. So advocates and council members is, is how you, you're kind of determining how the, the effect. Advocates, council members, elected officials, and crime victims. And, and, I have and actual survivors. I have input yeah. from actual survivors. Okay. So, and, and so uh, I just want to kind of lift one constituency up, the mm -hmm. LGBT, real, with real focus on trans and gender nonconforming New the Yorkers, LGBT trans Latinas. Is, they are a part of both of the other uh, groups that I mentioned, the quarterly advoc victim advocates meetings, when I meet with new immigrants groups, there's a focus on that community, and I meet with um, the LGBTQ community regularly, separately. We've been joined by Councilmember Drum from Queens. Do you have a question? And I'm going to hand it over to him uh, for questions. Sure, my question is for the NYPD. Um, is there a time frame in which someone needs to apply for a U or T visa? Um, no. Before or after the crime. So you will certify people going back. To how far into the past will you do that? As long as we have records that can document. So there's no time limit on no it? No time limit. Okay. Council Member, in, in my testimony, I was 
pleased to note that this was a, a change that was adopted by NYPD, that there is no longer a statute of limitations on a crime. So anybody now who uh, was affected by that time limit in the past can now apply? Many of those cases have been reviewed, cases that were within the last few years denied because of statute of limitations. I believe there were over 80 of them. They were all reviewed. How many? Over 80. And I believe that I know that they were all reviewed again, and many of them were approved. Okay. Okay, that's uh, thank you. Each one of them has been reviewed. Okay, thank you very much. That was my question. Thank you. So, uh, uh, I'd like to just add one thing oh, to an answer that I gave you before about we'd be happy to give you the records about people who were denied because of criminal history. We will include in that people who were approved who had criminal history because a, an incident alone is not dispositive of the case. And so you're going to see that there are lots of people who have had, have criminal histories who have been approved. And again, th this is more of a kind of just fact-finding mission and just trying to get as many details. And it might be telling, it might not be telling. Um, but thank you for your uh, kind of uh, refocus on, on possible data that, that might come out. But what, what we're trying to get to, and this is just my own learning in this whole process, mm -hmm. uh, as a non-DA or, or NYPD, or l I have, I'm not a lawyer, and, and so the, the kind of relationship between the d district attorneys and the NYPD in moments where your determination, early determination, what we are finding as an early moment in an application process where a denial might come in at the request of a district attorney, and really trying to understand if, there's, if we can make that better. Uh, and we can make that more fair for, for the applicant. You're talking and, about making the DA's process fair? Well, the holistically, the whole, the whole process, you know, an applicant will only see their application as one whole experience, but I think this is telling. I th our focus maybe might be on the, on the DA side. It'd be good just to see different perspectives about how we get to a decision. We, we send a case to the DA because we believe that the responsibility to be helpful is an ongoing responsibility. And we cannot have all the information about the relationship between the victim and the DA's office. That's up to the DA's office to deal with that. So, we send it to them in some cases where um, they send a case back to us in some cases, and then we review it. And th th there are two points that kind of come up. One is in that moment of uh, pushing it to the district attorney's office, um, the, does the case essentially go cold or does it, is it an automatic denial when it leaves you and goes no, to the it's not a, we haven't we haven't made a decision about it we've referred it okay. to the DA's office so it's still open so that's the 45 cases, days that we're talking about no, now no it's not the 45 days is our responsibility and so if we've referred it that's our decision that's not that's not an acceptance or a denial that's a referral and we've done that within 45 days then it goes to the DA if the DA sends it back to us um, and in some cases they do. Uh, that could be because somebody has, we are, we are reviewing something, they've given it to us, we've denied it, they may then go to the DA, that's different, that's not a referral. If the DA sends it back to us, those, are, those then would be appeals that we review, and in fact the majority of the appeals that we approve have come back from the DA's office. Do you have numbers on that as well? Of appeals. Appeals and approval from DA returns. Twelve in 2017. Twelve out of twenty. So Twelve out of twenty returns from DAs get approved. Yep. Tell me a little bit about timeline. So within the 45 days, you've made a determination of some sort: approval, denial, or referral. Is that right? Those That's are kind right. of the three options. In that referral to the DA's office, what is the timeline in which the DAs take typically to return? That I don't know. You don't know? Okay. And I don't know their time. Is that something you track? Decision. Do I track how long it takes the DA to send it back to us? No. Is that something you can track? I think it would be complicated. I mean, there, 
that's really their, their system. What makes it complicated? Because we send them a lot of cases that we never touch again, many of them. We never touch them again. So we could And cases we're referring to, just so I could be... Uh, cases the, where there's been an arrest, and we may never touch it again. Um, I, I'm referring to the cases you're talking about are applications, uh, applications for visas. Where someone has applied to the police department, and there has already been an arrest made. The case is in the DA's office system. We refer it to the DA. And some of those never come back. Many of those never come back. And do you, do you track that? How many, how many referrals never come back? We don't track that. Can you track that? It's sort of by, by default, right? Right. I mean, you could say we referred 20 and 12 came back. That's the. What makes it complicated, the, the number that I gave you before is numbers that came back to us from them. We, we send them many, many more cases than we ever see again. So it was 12 out of 20 that came back that we certified. Okay, well, how about let's, let's just see if we can get data points over time, um, it sounds like we could just go back and get. get I can somebody. tell you how many we referred to the DA. Okay. That I know. I have those numbers. Uh. Right. In 2017, we have referred 159 in 20, already. In 2016, we referred 166. In 2015, we referred 143. So I think by subtraction, you can figure out the number that you're looking for. Great. It, again, let's just work together to get a, a, a con. Uh, a complete chart with this data, and I, I know we could all do arithmetic, but it'd be good just to kind of mm -hmm. see it. Mm -hmm. Again, what we're trying to do is just put as much data on the wall, just to look at it. And I think that's that's what I want to do as someone who's learning this work and trying to make determinations as a legislator um, who wants to support the continued effort from the NYPD and all the agencies, including Moya, uh, leading this charge to just to do, to do better. So thank you for that, for that patience in this Q&A. Um, more, more questions? Council Member Drum. Yeah, thank you. Um, where we have seen um, some issues, and I think I've brought this to your attention in the past as well, but I'm wondering what's being done to correct it, is um, for very simple things about people being able to access their reports, their, their crime reports. In the past, we've had issues with the misspelling of names. Uh, we had a, a case where um, a woman was raped, but the um, daughter did the translation. Um, and, um, you know, she was asked by the police officers at that time to translate for her mother. Her mother didn't want to tell the daughter the details, so it was, um, had to be reconsidered at a later time. How are we dealing with that on the local level? Um, to make sure that the police officers in the precincts understand uh, and, um, and report these cases correctly. So I think you're, there are really two issues there. The case you're referring to ended up with an amended 61, and that's a process that's available to anybody. If more information comes to light at a later date, there can be an amended complaint. Um, that's available to anybody, and she, as I understand it, um, that happened in that case. So, so the, the second yes, issue that the, the, it was amended, but it was a battle to get it amended. It was also a battle to get the reports on, and change of the name for the misspelling of the names. That's something that we involved ourselves directly in. Had those folks not had um, access to my office or to knowing, um, you know, to to get a hold of a council member to to access these reports, that may not have ever have happened for them. So I'm wondering. What are we doing to change that at the local level? I think that you're speaking to a greater issue, which is um, language access. And what we have done 
is equip every member, every uniform member of the NYPD with a cell phone, and on every cell phone, they can essentially, through speed dial, uh, contact language line. We've also required that in domestic violence cases, before someone leaves the scene, um, we're rolling this out borough by borough, but before someone, an officer leaves the scene of a domestic violence incident, they have to either have spoken, used language line or a certified, an officer certified in a foreign language um, before they close out that case. So having language lines on the cell phone, changing our procedures in domestic violence cases, training our officers, making a real effort to certify more and more officers. We've doubled the number of certified officers in the last few years. So we are actively addressing what I think is really the greater issue in your question, which is language barriers. I think another part of it is also, um, uh, do police officers take a proactive stance in terms of informing those victims who they think might be eligible for a U or T visa that they in fact could apply for that if, 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 it, if it appears that they're eligible? We don't, and we, we uh, agree with the district attorneys who do not do that either because we feel having an individual police officer or an individual detective talking to a victim about this in an individual case could very likely look like a quid pro quo, and that's something we want to avoid. We are fully supportive, however, of Moya's efforts and OCDV's efforts and MACJ's efforts, anyone's efforts to talk generally about this requirement. And in fact, putting up information about our guidelines on our website, we're about to give the city a downloadable PDF about our guidelines that can go on the city's website as well. So we participate in outreach, but we do not do it on an individual basis. It's very important to note, and I'll, I'll wait if you'd like, it's very, it's very important to note that the victim advocates that are now in two-thirds of our precincts can talk to individual victims and do. That's appropriate, but it's not appropriate for the department or an individual officer to talk in an individual case about conferring a benefit. DAs, as you know, I'm sure need to disclose uh, the existence of a certification, need to disclose that. It's, it is practice because it looks like a benefit that is being conferred on somebody. So we stay away from it, as do the DAs. So I, 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 it I, think, I think I disagree with the use of the word pro quo, uh, quid pro quo because um, it is a quid pro quo to a certain extent. Because if they're cooperating with us, we then offer them the opportunity to get the U visa. That's the way it's designed. Actually, it's the federal government who says if you cooperate with local law enforcement, but it starts your on the local immigration level. status can be paused so that you cooperate with local law enforcement. We stay away from anything that looks like we're conferring a benefit. We don't pay victims. We don't give them special favors. It's not anything in exchange for your testimony or your participation. So that's our policy, and we do a, a lot of outreach by putting things up on the web and encouraging the city to do outreach. And that differs from other, other cities like Oakland or other places around the United States. Where they talk to individual mm -hmm. officers? They may, they may do that. This is our interpretation, and it's certainly the interpretation of the five DAs. Well, my concern is like, I, and I'm sorry I was a little late getting here this morning. It was primary night last night, so. Um, <laughs> but, um, and I didn't have one, so I got lucky, but I had was supporting other people, <laughs> including our chair. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, in, in, in the uh, public education piece of, I guess it was um, May's Office of Immigrant Affairs, I see that you make reference to education, but I'm not sure that everybody has access to Basically, what you're talking about is, is, is online. And um, okay. I mean, I, I really would like to see a more proactive stance taken in terms of how we get this message out to local people who have been affected because the people who have come into my office where we have been successful in a number of cases where, this were, where there were impediments to, 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 to actually having these yeah, folks get this yeah. U visas. Um, 
you know, um, it was because we informed them. You know, I mean, I, I can give you examples of cases, and I think um, the commissioner from the NYPD is aware of it, where we had a, a Bangladeshi guy who was, um, you know, held up at knife point, and they put the knife to his throat, he pulled it away, his fingers were sliced, et cetera. He had no idea, you know, and so we find in my office that this is continually happening, that folks do not know that they're even eligible for this. And, and so I think part of what we're looking at doing and part of the legislation that we passed last week here in the council is to begin to really address some of these issues. Yeah, no, I appreciate I appreciate um, the question. I would just correct in saying that it's not only done online currently. It's done in a number of other ways. I think um, Deputy Commissioner Herman described that even within the precincts, there are crime victim uh, service advocates and services that are conducted by Safe Horizon. Um, and in, in that context, even people do proactively receive information on U visas and, and T visas. Um, sim similarly or separately, we've worked in partnership with the Office to Combat Domestic Violence on outreach and engagement, obviously at the family justice centers, but even beyond um, through informational material that we distribute in communities that, my, that our team at Moya has information on and is sharing. I think we're always open and interested in how we can do that work more effectively um, and with increased impact, and would love to kind of continue those conversations with you. Commissioner, are, are those materials available in precincts? Um, with, with the crime victim advocates. With what? With the crime victim, the crime victim advocates. advocates. Yeah. Sorry. The crime victim advocates have those materials at their disposal and to distribute. We, the, I mean, as you know, individual officers are not allowed to talk to yes. individual victims about their immigration status. And that may be a New York phenomenon. That's, a, that's our executive order. It's also a different criminal law statute here in New York City than it might be in other states. But our officers do not engage in that discussion with victims of crime. And, but we are fully supportive of talking generally about this benefit, but not one-on-one. -on -one. Right, and I'm not necessarily advocating that people begin to ask um, what country they may come from or anything like that. What I'm advocating for is a broader sense of educating the public about their rights. So if that information is available in the crime victim's packet, that's one way. Another way may be through some signage or something like that because I find that this is the biggest obstacle to people getting access to UNT visas. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think aloud how we can make that process better. So that's, that's the, the purpose of my line of questioning here. Uh, do we have any signage in precincts? I don't do we have it. signage on other issues in precincts? We have signage about language access. I'm and sorry? We, we have signage about language access mm -hmm. and uh, people's ability to have translation. We also have... Go ahead. I was going to add IDNYC. Signage on, on IDNYC is in precincts as well. Wait, can you repeat that again? IDNYC, the municipal ID card, as well as language access. We have signage about those two issues, at least. Just to, clar just to clarify, sorry. To, 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 and then you're going to include the visa information on that same signage? No. Is that what I heard? No, no. you didn't hear that. Okay. So that's why I wanted to clarify that. Okay. So just to, to clear this point up, the only signage that will be going into precincts are ID and YC. No, I'm not okay. saying it's the only. I'm so saying clarify what, what the, the question commissioner was, said. what kinds of signs do we have? And those are two signs that I know we have. We may have other signs in precincts. We certainly have signs about municipal ID cards, and we have signs about language access. Are NCO officers um, educated or trained in uh, any um, U or T visa issues, uh, eligibility, et cetera? Are any, did you say city officers? No, NCO, the new NCOs. NCO officers. NCOs, um, I, to my knowledge, do not get special training in this area currently. The new immigrants unit does. I think that would be another way to build a relationship with the immigrant communities if those officers, in fact, were to receive training and in their course of meeting with organizations and groups 
say that these visas are available in a general public way? So, as you know, the bulk of our U visa requests are domestic violence related. Our domestic violence officers do get training in this and have for some time, so they are equipped to discuss it. Uh, our new immigrants but Commissioner, unit just, also. But the domestic violence officers, that's only, people would only see those domestic violence officers probably when they go in to report a crime. Well, actually, they, that speaks to your, your concern or your interest in having people who do outreach. They do a tremendous amount of outreach to local groups in their precincts. So they are out and about speaking, and they can talk about UNT visas. Okay. I'm not going to belabor the point. They but also I think do we home visits. So it's not just that people come into the precincts. Part of their responsibility is to conduct home visits. So they do outreach, to not do, only to, to do home visits, but they don't do community forums. They do do community oh, they do. forums. Okay. That's, that's what I'm saying. They, they do many outreach events in the communities. Okay. All right. Not to belabor the point, but I just am thinking loud and would love to see how we can explore those types of ideas more. I think we can do more. I really do. I just want to emphasize that it is um, very much the, the mission of Moya and OCDV to get this out. They're doing a great job, and we support their work in this area. Same with the Human Rights Commission. They're getting it out as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Trum. We've also been joined by Councilmember Matthew Jean from Brooklyn. And I want to uh, I want to also wrap this up and, and move over to the advocates, and I'm hoping you can leave somebody on your team here to continue to work or uh, to continue to take notes throughout the rest of the hearing. Um, and speaking of advocates, uh, I don't know if, you, if there's a way that you can kind of describe that relationship in the process that I'm trying to get a better sense of between the DA's office and the NYPD in referrals. Um, it's, it's, it's my understanding through conversations with the advocates that that, that referral is technically a denial. Um, it's not communication, a denial. Communication is given to the survivor uh, or the lawyer about that application process? The communication says it's been referred to the DA's office. It does not say it's been denied. But I guess what I'm saying is, well, before my question, well, before my statement, the question is, what, what in that case in the referral that we're not yet clear about the timeline in which it comes back? And so we're going to do some research and we're going we're gonna, to we're going to talk to the it DA. It doesn't always come back, remember. Many of yep, them are handled by the DA. But they come back. We don't know the timeline and how long it takes because it's different cases. But we'll, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll, right. bring, we'll bring them to the table and have a conversation with them. But what I'm trying to understand is essentially the applicant in this process will then have to renew their application and start over. And what kind of communication is the survivor getting from, from that referral, if any? They For are, example, they does are the survivor told, know at all that their case was referred? How do they get communicated? No, uh, they should all know. We send them a letter that says uh, that their case Tell me about referred. that letter. The letter tells applicants what action was taken, whether it was accepted, denied, and if it's denied, again, on our own, we created boxes that explain what the reasons are for the denial, and it may say referred, referred to the DA's office, which is not put in the column of denial. It's this case has been referred. So then the applicant doesn't have to reapply? They do. They send. They do. They, do. they have to send an application. As if it were a new case. Yes, because time has passed. The case is in the DA's office. They may not have spoken to that portion of the case, that portion of the timeline where they might have been helpful, and they want to put that in their application. Okay, so I guess it may, this is just semantics, but essentially what I'm hearing, if I was an applicant, is that I would have to reapply, and therefore I was effectively denied. Not denied, but referred, and therefore I have There's to reapply no again. There's no prejudice involved here. You haven't been denied. You have to reapply, and if you're working with an advocate or attorney or even on your own, if you know that it's going to the DA's office and you know that helpfulness is what they're looking for, you may want to supplement your application at this point because they're going to be looking at post-arrest. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to continue this conversation later, but this is 
it's still hazy for me in, in a lot of ways, and we want to bring the DAs in to help clarify and the advocates. Mm -hmm. Are there any communications, is there any communication with the advocates at this point before a referral in maybe helping make a different determination? Are they brought into the process as advocates it's or lawyers? It's not a different determination. If, it's, if there's been an arrest, we send it. That's our policy. So okay. a conversation about why we should or shouldn't send it to the DA. If there's been an arrest, our policy is that we send it to the DA. And okay. I think advocates know that. Okay. And I think attorneys know that. And when we participate in a CLE with attorneys, we tell them that. And when we talk with advocates, we tell them that. It's not confusion. There may be disagreement about the policy, but there's no confusion about it. Okay. Well, again, I, I, let's continue this conversation. Th you've given me some new, new details, new information, new texture, and this is an important thing, I think, for all of us to continue. Uh, to do together. Uh, there's no doubt that you all receive, should receive so much praise and credit for the work that you've done already to internally change the access points, the information, the transparency. So we want to we wanna applaud that. Uh, that's, that's, we're, we're pointing in the right direction. The mm -hmm. compass is there. We're, mm -hmm. we're pointing north. We're going. We're moving. And so we want to say thank you for that. Um, and really on, on Councilmember Drum's point about communication, education, there are multiple agents, and I'm not just talking about police officers, but other people who are going to want to be held, we're going to need to hold accountable, and that's our offices in the city council, uh, advocates in the neighborhood, city agencies, to really think about how we holistically approach this in a time where many know your rights sessions are happening in our neighborhoods, people are having more questions, in the same time as fear is increasing, uh, there, people are coming to places where they find sanctuary, like churches and other places. So we have to figure out a way that this becomes not just, uh, or that this gets added to the IDNYC work that we're doing, that gets added to the adult education services that we're doing, that it gets added to all the things that, that we're doing as a city. And so uh, it's not just on you, and, and, and I get that. I see that conflict of interest there, but it means that we need to all work together and you need to be at the table when we think about that. And so I'm hoping... I, I agree with you and I think that outreach is really important. I think we... I don't want to leave the impression at all that we don't do general outreach. Our new immigrants unit does general outreach. Our outreach to attorneys and victim advocates always includes discussion of this. And we have met actually with faith leaders to talk to them about what, what people... you know, our involvement and what these... Uh, resources are. So we do general outreach, but we do not do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Thank you, and, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Councilmember Member but before that, I want to ask a little bit about the, the crime, the crime um, types that are coming in. You mentioned in your test, or in your responses, about domestic violence being, being one of the highest... Uh, the underlying crime that gives rise to the application for a certification most of the ones that come in for U visas involve domestic violence. Are there any other crimes that come out, even not, not at that high peak, but are there other examples of other crimes that are coming in? Sure. What are the other, what are the other examples? It's, it's all across the board, frankly. All across I mean, the board. Yeah. Is there anything that's not coming in right now? It's just another data point. Is there any crime that's not coming in we have, there are 175 qualifying crimes, right? And so. No, if there, if, all right, 131 qualifying crimes. Is there any, or 31? Is there anything that's not coming in? Community. Okay, so there are 31 qualifying crimes. Excuse me, and we don't get all of them. One of them is peonage. We haven't gotten anything alleging peonage, and is there anything else that we? And there's several archaic crimes in that list. We haven't seen labor labor disputes. Labor disputes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is this is important for us to kind of see throughout the the certifying you're talking crimes. Talking about the underlying crime. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to be clear. Okay. And. So, so my colleague is reminding me that robbery is not one of the qualifying crimes. 
but we have certified people where they have talked about robbery by using assault two and saying that that could satisfy a robbery claim given the facts of the individual case. So somebody comes to us and talks about robbery, but that's not what the documents reveal. It hasn't been a robbery charge. Robbery isn't one of the qualifying crimes, but we have found a way in some cases to say uh, we can figure out a way to get this to be one of the qualifying crimes. Robbery is a good example. Thank you. Now this is really uh, uh, productive, and, mm -hmm. and let's keep talking about that, that, that kind of data area and just to understand more about what is coming in and what's not coming in uh, as we continue to think about uh, further recommendations. Councilmember Drum? No, just to also say I agree with your assessment that um, things have changed under this administration greatly, and we appreciate your efforts. Commissioner Mustafi and Commissioner Herman, I also appreciate uh, your responsiveness to the issues that uh, we brought to you, and, um, and we, we're very grateful for that as well. So thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, um, thank you for being here today um, on this post-primary morning, um, and we look forward to working with you in, in the very near future. And, uh, and now we're going to move over to the advocates. Thank you so much. And our first panel, we have from the Legal Aid Society, Hannah Shapiro, Sanctuary for Families, Carmen Maria Rey, Catholic Charities Community Services, Marianne Terapil. Therapil. Did I say that right? Brooklyn Defender Services, Sophie Dalsimer, and American Immigration Lawyers Association, Jennifer Durkin. And we have three panels total. I will remind you to fill out a appearance card here with the Sergeant of Arms if you would like to speak today. And remind me, who from the NYPD is going to be here? Thank you for identifying yourselves. Thank you. And then Moya, you'll be here. Awesome. Thank you. Any other agencies that have that have representatives here from Children's Services? Thank you. The Law Department of Family Court. Thank you for being here. Any other city agencies? Mayor's Office. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for being here. Okay, and when you're ready, good you can start. Sorry. Um, good morning, all. I uh, am Carmen Maria Rey. I will be reading testimony from the American Immigration Lawyers Association on behalf of Jennifer Durkin, who's chair of the New York chapter of AILA. Um, she is unable to give testimony as she is ill. Um, the American Immigration Lawyers Association was established in New York City in 1946 to, amongst other goals, promote justice and advocate for fair and reasonable immigration law and policy. Our 1,625 members in New York City represent the great majority of attorneys practicing immigration law. We have drawn upon their expertise in drafting this testimony. We thank City Council for holding today's hearing to examine best practices for New York City law enforcement agencies to certify immigrant victims to apply for UNT non-immigrant status, also known as UNT visas with federal immigration authorities. Um, the Mayor's Office um, for Immigrant Affairs did a great job of summarizing um, the uh, requirements for UNT non-immigrant status, but please bear with me as we walk the audience through why these uh, forms of relief were created, as it will help to uh, clarify some of the testimony that you will later hear from advocates. UNT status was created by federal authorities with a dual purpose. First, to strengthen the ability of law enforcement to detect, investigate, and prosecute serious criminal activities, and second, to protect immigrant victims of such criminal activities. These forms of immigration relief serve to foster increased trust between law enforcement agencies and the immigrant populations they serve by easing immigrant victims' fear of deportation. Consequently, the mere filing of a U or T application may serve as the basis for a non-citizen to request release from immigration detention, a continuance of removal proceedings, and in New York State, it will even allow a victim to obtain access to publicly funded health care. In addition, unlike other temporary forms of immigration status, UNT status grants applicants a potential path to U.S. citizenship. 
Both U and T applications require non-citizen applicants to establish that they were victims of either a qualifying crime or of a severe form of trafficking and assisted in the investigation of that crime. T applicants can submit Form I-914 Supplement B, Declaration of Law Enforcement Officer for Victims of Trafficking and Persons with their application, in order to demonstrate that both of the elements required are met, but they can rely on alternate evidence. Conversely, U applicants must submit Form I-918 U Non-Immigrant Status Certification signed by either a judge, the head of a law enforcement agency with which they cooperated, or a person specifically designated by the head of that agency with their application to establish their help helpfulness to law enforcement. In signing certifications for U or T non-immigrant status, law enforcement officials, judges, or prosecutors do not confer any immigration status upon the victim, but rather only enable the victim to meet one of the eligibility requirements in the victim's application to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Only the Department of Homeland Security has the discretion to grant or deny U status to a victim. In determining U or T status to a victim, in determining whether to sign a U or T certification, law enforcement must believe that a victim was, is, or will be, quote unquote, helpful. Helpfulness means that the victim has been, is, or is likely to assist law enforcement or other government officials in the detection, investigation, prosecution, conviction, or sentencing of the qualifying criminal activity. Importantly, in recognition that it is sometimes unsafe for a victim to continue cooperating, the law allows for victims to stop cooperating, and as long as their refusal to continue cooperating is not unreasonable, they can continue to be considered helpful. In addition, in recognition that Congress intended that a victim be able to apply for status at different stages of an investigation or prosecution, law enforcement officials may complete certifications once they're able to assess a victim's helpfulness and don't have to wait to the completion of an investigation or prosecution prior to signing a certification. Best practices and issuances of U non-immigrant status certifications and T non-immigrant status cer certifications allow for case-by-case -case adjudication of requests that takes into consideration the circumstances, including barriers to continued cooperation faced by individual victims. If a victim has been helpful in detecting or investigating criminal activity, certifying agencies can and should issue U visa certification even if the victim later found it too difficult to continue cooperating, and that certification should be issued in a timely manner. In New York City, youth certifiers include local agencies as disparate as the Human Rights Commission, the Administration for Children's Services, and Corporation Council, and yet there exist possible certifiers like the Civilian Complaint Review Board, the Department of Corrections, um, and others that investigate qualifying crimes but do not currently have a policy or practice of issuing either U or T certifications. We would recommend that the city create a list of all possible certifiers and encourage their issuance of publicly available certification policies. This would maximize New Yorkers' access to these valuable forms of immigration relief. Additionally, in light of the value of the certification, all certifiers should create a process to make it possible for those certifi requesting certification to appeal a denial of certification. To date, only the New York City Police Department has created an appeal process after substantial advocacy by um, community members. Lastly, all certifiers should have designated signatories for both U and T certifications. Um, ACS just recently created a T certification process after advocacy. They should also have trained and well-resourced staff in charge of internal process of certification. And most importantly, any and all UNT certification policies should be flexible and err towards issuance to allow the non-citizen victim an opportunity to present their case and seek immigration relief before federal authorities. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it was a really good, actually, good overview to begin. So um, thank you for the kind of overview and even the recommendations. Uh, we have we have a pretty packed list, and so we're going to put the clock at three minutes. If there's any kind of focus on on new ideas that that can be brought to us, and then we're going to do a round of questions from from us um, at the council level, and and we'll start the clock at three. And if we can keep to time, so we can get through everyone uh, for the one o'clock uh, uh, hearing here that will start soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good morning. 
Good morning. Um, my name is Hannah Shapiro. I'm a domestic violence immigration project attorney at the Legal Aid Society. I want to thank the council for the opportunity to testify today. Um, the Legal Aid Society's immigration practice um, is one of the largest providers of removal defense in New York City, and we specialize in the intersection of immigration and criminal law. Our DV immigration project also specializes in this intersection as it impacts survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking. As the U is the primary form of relief for most of our clients, we have been integrally involved in providing feedback for the de development of local protocols for ACS, the New York City Police Department, and the New York Family Courts for over a decade. We would like to acknowledge the great process, progress that has been made by ACS as well as the NYPD, particularly the positive improvements that the NYPD has made in implementing an appeals process and the timeliness of their process. However, we'd like to focus our testimony today on the policies that affect the most vulnerable crime victims, those that have criminal histories, themse criminal histories themselves. In this era of heightened enforcement, they are more likely to be targeted by ICE and at risk of re uh, removal and separation from their families. It's not uncommon for crime victims to have entanglements with the criminal justice system due to a history of violence, abuse, and poverty. Domestic violence and trafficking survivors provide the most obvious example as they often have a range of offenses such as drug crimes, prostitution, grand larceny stemming from their victimization. A crime victim's own criminal history should not function as a barrier to the issuance of a U certification. Conducting background checks allows certifiers to essentially function as gatekeepers and empowers them to unjustly deny a U certification to crime victims who are otherwise eligible for the U visa based on amorphous and malleable, quote, public safety considerations. We should strive for equity in our certification de determinations across all city agencies. Besides the New York City Police Department, no other state or city certifier, including the five district attorney's offices, conducts criminal background checks as part of their U certification process. At the NYPD, they happen behind the scenes and are not transparent or even listed in their pr protocol despite being an integral component of their certification process. Advocates have been objecting to the NYPD's use of background checks since the genesis of its U certification program. Given our agency's limited resources and capacity, we often elect not to apply for use certifications from the NYPD where there's another possible certifier. This is due to the likelihood that it would be denied based on the victim's own criminal background. Those clients who've been able to obtain certifications from other certifiers, such as the DA's offices or ACS, have successfully obtained U non-immigrant status, gone on to become lawful permanent residents and reunite with their families. Where the NYPD is the only possible certifier, um, we find ourselves in a tough situation. Advocates are forced to engage in a back and forth with the NYPD regarding our clients um, to contextualize our clients' criminal histories and provide highly sensitive and confidential information. Um, essentially, the NYPD um, is trying to ascertain whether our clients are, quote, worthy of a use certification, and we believe that this issue is duly addressed by the USCIS. Our goal should be to ensure that certification policies are just and accessible, particularly to those who are most vulnerable and marginalized in our city. Criminal background checks and certification decisions do not advance this goal. We applaud the City Council's successful effort to protect due process for all non-citizen detained New Yorkers in removal proceedings by restoring the funding to the NIFA program for all immigrants regardless of their, the severity of their criminal histories. We need the Council to make sure that our policies toward immigrant New Yorkers are consistent on this point by ensuring that criminal background checks be eliminated from NYPD's U certification process. A Allowing these background checks to continue hinders some of those very same clients protected by the knife up restoration of funding from obtaining the use certifications that they need to defend their own removal. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm glad you brought up some budget, budget items as well. Um, that, that's a big factor in this conversation about resources uh, because this is a, he a heavy resource intensive process. Uh, and so I will remind you, I think most of you have written testimony, so if there's anything that you want to kind of call to the top to make sure that we get, get that, uh, let's, let's try to stick to three minutes. And any new ideas, too, that would be good for us to, to focus on. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm 
get to go again on behalf of Sanctuary for Families. In the interest of time, I'll introduce the agency and just move to our most salient points. Sanctuary for Families is the nation's largest immigration legal practice for survivors of domestic violence and trafficking victims. Since being established in 84, we've served to educate and advocate on behalf of survivors of these and other types of gender-based violence. Over the last decade, we've been instrumental in working with city agencies and the courts to create and standardize the issuance of UNT non-immigrant status certifications. The availability of and accessibility to these certifications is of the utmost importance to our clients. On average, we file over 400 applications for UNT non-immigrant status per year with federal authorities. By issuing URT certifications, law enforcement agencies confirm only that the applicant was a victim of crime and was cooperative in their investigation or prosecution of such crime. The signing of a certification does not confer immigration status. The city must therefore eliminate existing policies that needlessly limit access to certification, like those denying issuance of use certification because of past contact with criminal authorities. Policies like this serve little purpose other than to prevent eligible New Yorkers from accessing immigration relief. Recently, one of our clients, a victim of severe sex trafficking and other serious crimes, including domestic violence, who had cooperated extensively with authorities in the investigation of a violent assault, requested use certification from the New York City Police Department. Although the use certification policies at NYPD have, without doubt, dramatically improved in recent years, the agency in this case denied her certification request based on her suspected, quote unquote, past criminal activity. Our client has no past criminal convictions, but despite efforts to receive further clarification about the denial, we received no response. Our appeal was denied. Our client should not have been denied a certification even if she had prior criminal convictions, and this unsettling outcome has only served to increase her vulnerability to further exploitation because of her further lack of immigration status. By the way, she also has a prior order of removal um, that has already been reinstated, and we know ICE is looking for her. This is a woman who, because of the denial of her use certification, will never again cooperate with law enforcement in New York if she's a victim of crime. The risk is too high. as. ICE continues to patrol our courtrooms. The certification process requires law enforcement only to verify victimization and cooperation. Incorporating additional requirements serves no good purpose and fails to recognize both the complexity of a victim's life and an individual's ability to be rehabilitated from past criminal conduct. Many of our clients, victims of domestic violence or human trafficking that we represent in successful immigration applications, have severe criminal conviction records that are sometimes directly related to their very victimization. It is common for trafficked persons to have prostitution arrests, robbery arrests, convictions. Some of our clients have faced retaliatory charges. Others have defended themselves against vicious attacks on their lives and hurt their abusers in the process. All of this information is not available to a certifier when determining whether or not to grant certification. Others of our clients have made past mistakes and later turned their lives around, refusing this vi th these victims certification based on past suspected or proven criminal conduct fails to acknowledge those realities. Thank you. My name is Sophie Dalsimer. I'm an immigration attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services, where I work with the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project team, and I represent detained clients who are in immigration detention facing removal. I do want to thank the City Council for its continuing support to NIFUP and for its commitment to defending immigrant New Yorkers. Many of our clients have been victims of crimes and are eligible for U visas, yet despite recent changes to the NYPD process for the certification of U visas, the NYPD continues to delay decisions in certification and to deny certification because of our clients' criminal histories. As an illustration, I would like to briefly share two stories of clients I've worked with. Um, one is a woman who is middle-aged from Jamaica, mother, victim of domestic violence for several years who was too afraid to approach law enforcement because she feared she would be deported if she did so. She finally came forward to report the abuse. Her abuser fled because he feared law enforcement and ultimately um, returned to the Jamaica where they were originally from. Once uh, Ms. this client was in removal proceedings, we requested a U certification, but she was denied based on her extensive criminal history according to the NYPD. Her hi criminal history included a series of shoplifting related arrests. She was someone who had struggled for many years being illiterate and uh, caring and raising two daughters as a single mother. The, we have filed an appeal. The appeal was also denied. 
Another instance is a young man from El Salvador who came here when he was 16 and was brutally beaten with a steel bat. He suffered severe traumatic brain injuries and required multiple surgeries during a long period of hospitalization. He cooperated with the police following that to help identify the attackers and locate the suspects. Unfortunately, they were never found or arrested. After his traumatic brain injury, he experienced significant changes in his behavior, and he was arrested twice for nonviolent misdemeanor offenses. On the basis of those offenses, the NYPD denied our request for U certification. We filed an appeal, and ultimately, the, on appeal, the certification was granted, but the appeal process took over six months, during which this client remained detained in immigration detention. In short, the NYPD's refusal to issue U visa certifications based on a victim's criminal history defeats the purpose of the U visa itself and stands in stark contrast to the city's commitment to protecting immigrant New Yorkers. In both of the cases I highlighted, we were given no further indication in either the initial denial or the appeal as to why their criminal history specifically warranted a denial. The NYPD Deputy Commissioner uh, Susan Herman, who spoke earlier, did note that it is, it is a discretionary process that the NYPD undertakes. However, um, we are provided no reasons on, uh, as to what factors they take into consideration during that process. And as advocates, we need the NYPD to articulate the specific reasons that they are denying use certification for our clients in each individual case. For example, do they consider arrests and convictions separately? Are there certain convictions that they consider disqualifying? Are they more concerned about recent convictions? Do they weigh the record of someone's arrest history against the cooperati cooperation that the petitioner provided to the NYPD? And do they consider any other mitigating factors? All we get is a denial letter with a box check that says criminal history. It would be extremely helpful if there was a point person or a person that we could reach out to for more information in terms of their decision-making process. I would also just note as well that the length of the, um, did not, the appeal process has been extraordinarily long in our mm -hmm. experience, and our clients do remain, many of them, detained in immigration custody throughout that process where they could be using the certification as uh, an argument to further support their request for release on bond, perhaps. Finally, uh, I would agree with my colleagues here that the NYPD really does not need to be denying these requests based on a criminal history as the U application process requires extensive scrutiny of an individual's background and it, it's not necessary for the NYPD to, to undertake that decision making at this stage in the process. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marianne Therapel and I'm the Special Projects Director at the Immigrant and Refugee Services of Catholic Charities Community Services for the Archdiocese of New York. For more than 40 years, Catholic Charities has been committed to serving New York immigrants, be they families seeking to reunify, children, refugees, the undocumented, or workers. We are honored to testify today at today's hearing alongside immigrant and refugee advocates and colleagues from other nonprofits and before the New York City Committee on Immigration, whose commitment to preserving and protecting the rights of New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, we applaud. We thank you for inviting us here today. In its role as a legal advocate for New Yorkers, Catholic Charities has the opportunity to apply for U visas for hundreds of people each year. We are one of many organizations that does this type of work. However, we are one of few that processes these applications on behalf, behalf of victims of crime who are not victims of domestic violence. And thus, we have a unique perspective on the experience of crime victims outside of the domestic violence sphere. We request U visa certifications from law enforcement and other agencies across the country, and we testify today to our experience with New York City agencies. Earlier this year, an attorney at Catholic Charities was able to receive a U visa certification from the New York County District Attorney's Office in just a few days. The, their immediate response to our request enabled us to halt the deportation of a man who has lived in New York City since 1993, is married to a U.S. citizen, and is the proud father of a young woman who is graduating with a nursing degree next year. Because the Manhattan District Attorney's Office had a single point of contact for collecting requests for U visa certification and a streamlined process for deciding whether to certify, we were able to promptly obtain the certification and present it to the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, just, before, just days before they were to deport our client. In this case, having a streamlined, accessible, and responsive U visa certification process made the difference between immediate deportation, probably preceded by detention, and a path to achieving legal status through a U visa application. 
We encourage all city agencies to build a process that mirrors this, offering a single point of contact, a streamlined process with well-publicized requirements, and the capacity to consider both appeals and requests to expedite. Certifying agencies must publish an identifiable, identifiable point of contact and a streamlined certification process that provides for expedited requests and appeals. As mentioned before, the procedures for requesting U visa certifications vary widely from agency to agency. Often we are aware of who the certifying official is at an agency, but that individual is not the person who collect, collects requests. City agencies that issue U visa certifications must designate a single point of public contact to collect requests. Contact information should be publicly available on agency websites, not hidden within a page, but publicly seen and very easily accessible. It would also be very helpful for advocates to understand each agency's certification process and requirements for initial certification requests, file requests, for example, with ACS, which proves to be very difficult continually. The NYPD must also consider certifications when district attorney offices refuse to. In our experience, the NYPD has refused to issue certifications in cases in which an arrest has been sent to the DA's office. Recently, DA's offices have been refusing to issue certifications in cases that have been sealed after conviction. In such cases where the victim cooperated in the investigation, we request that NYPD revisit their policy of refusing to issue certifications. Perhaps NYPD would consider accepting these requests on a case-by-case -case basis with accompanying letters from the DA's office. Thank you. Thank you for that. And again, thank you for all, all the testimony. Councilmember Drum, do you have any questions? Not really a question, but just an observation. Sometimes I wish we heard from the advocates before the administration <laughs> <laughs> so I could ask more in-depth questions, but I found your testimony to be very informative, and uh, the next time we go at it, we'll make sure to raise some of these issues as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will continue to go at it, no doubt. Uh, I want to um, ask act actually a, a kind of good follow up to Councilmember Drum's kind of point about just the illumination that you've brought with your testimony. What is your relationship to each of these agencies that are working with you? Um, give me a sense of ranking. Who's the best? Who's the worst? What kind of. Uh, <laughs> I'll do Don't worry, that. we're not, we're not, we're not going live stream or anything, and, and uh, the world is not watching. Uh, do you want me to take it? No, that's actually why we want to talk about it because the world is watching right now, and we want to make sure that we get a good sense about about this because while we've made strides, we have, and we've all noted them. We're not there yet, and I'm not happy. We're not happy about where where we could be um, in time that we're in right now with this federal government and when relief can come to a survivor of a victim, we want it to come swiftly. That is, the, that is the promise of a sanctuary city. And so tell us, be honest about uh, what and where agencies are in communication, engagement, bringing you to the table. Thank you. Um, I think I've been designated to answer that question. Um, so for New York City agencies, um, I think there's very, folks feel very strongly that the Human Rights Commission is very good and very accepting. Um, Labor Department, very good, very accepting. The Administration for Children's Services has consistently been amazing, although um, somewhat under-resourced lately, and so we're seeing increased delays in issuance of certifications, whereas usually, you know, formerly, they were very prompt. Well, can um, you just expand on that? So you're saying that because of the, the just the flow? Right. So we're see, I don't, we don't, because we don't have access to the back door kind of information. We don't know if it's just a massive increase in the number of requests that they're trying to process down, but we have seen just an uptick in, in an increased delay, not only at the Administration for Children's Services, but throughout the district attorney's offices as well. Um, NYPD is actually, you know, they, I, I agree with Marianne that they really um, should um, in create a, um, a clear process for expediting of use certifications, but generally they're act actually quite prompt in issuing the first decision. Um, their appeals process isn't uh, as prompt as it probably should be, but they should be praised for having one, whereas others don't. Um, so I guess that is to say each of the certifiers has good points. Um, for ACS, for example, it's their expansiveness and willing to consider the well-being of the family and just kind of seeing how they can um, look at that case in order to 
try to make the victim um, uh, eligible to apply for, for, for status. Um, and in that, they should really be commended. And, that, and to, you know, to some degree, that comes from their background as kind of seeing the whole unit of the family and trying to make sure that they're uh, well taken care of. Um, so it's not a great answer, but it's what we have. Again, thank you. And let's continue the, that, that line of engagement and just, again, the texture of the communication and quantifying that in ways of rulemaking and legislation. And that helps us build the institution that we're going to need, the institu institutionalization of connection with agencies and, uh, and advocates. Councilmember Drum? Yeah, just to follow up. Um, uh, when somebody does get a denial, um, does it differ from the NYPD denial to the DA's denial? Do they give reasons uh, other than criminal history, or does a um, client have to inquire about why the denial was, or why why they got the denial? Can you just walk me through that a little bit? So I, it's with the DAs, it's pretty clear. Um, Either, well, not always actually. <laughs> Sometimes it's very clear. Either uh, they can certify or the record has been sealed. So they arguably say they have no access to any records to determine helpfulness or qualifying crime. Um, sometimes we run into issues with the DAs on the issue of helpfulness and that sort of a, can be a more teased out kind of conversation and some offices are more receptive than others. Um, with the NYPD, we're really not being told or have a way of understanding what the basis for the denial is, where they either check off helpfulness, qualifying crime, or criminal history because they haven't articulated why they don't believe a, a qualifying crime has occurred. And I think most advocates, when we submit these requests, are framing that particular issue. In addition, as to helpfulness, there we you know we, we have no access to their their records to kind of understand where they reached how they reached that kind of conclusion, and so we're left in the dark a lot, particularly with the NYPD, um, where we come into this issue a lot more frequently and sort of on a regular basis, and then have to tap into our already limited resources to try to frame appeals based on information that we don't even really know was the basis of their decision making, and so we're a little bit. Um, grasping at different kinds of arguments to try to make sure we're, we're best advocating for our clients, but it's just not an efficient or good use of anyone's time or resources, and for all the reasons I highlighted in my testimony, it's really not a dialogue um, that, particularly on the criminal history issue, that the NYPD even needs to engage on. And so I think there are ways that they could streamline their own process and open up access to use certifications in a way that's much more broad and leave certain determinations to the immigration authorities that um, will certainly deal with public safety kinds of issues. And just to add to what Hannah said, one thing about that's interesting about the UNT uh, certif certification process and the, the status itself is that the federal government specifically designated this, these forms of relief to overcome prior poor conduct. So unlike other types of immigration relief, you may have uh, some very serious convictions. As long as you're not a Nazi or a have committed genocide, the government can consider your application and grant you the right to remain in the United States. So if the federal government and the statute that created the relief is that generous, and if the certification requirements set out by the federal government don't require local certifiers to verify criminal history and deny based on criminal history, why then are certifiers taking that additional cost and delay upon themselves to make a determination of whether or not to grant certification? I bet I know why, but anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what is the criteria for helpfulness? I read that in my testimony. It is, um, it's actually set out in the regulations for the U, and effectively it's that the law enforcement agency finds that the, that the victim had information that helped them in some way with their investigation. And that's a very expansive definition. Um, it also doesn't require, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you can determine that it's not 
that you are no longer able to cooperate. And a certifier can look at your circumstances and determine that that is reasonable. And so they can certify anyway. For example, I had a couple, uh, we had a case a couple of years ago out of the Brooklyn DA's office where my client um, was physically in the United States. She was originally from Pakistan. The abuser from, was from Pakistan. The abuser's family was back in Pakistan. The abuser had coerced his family into threatening my client and her family's life. Um, in Pakistan, they had tried to go to the police. There was no recourse under their laws to protect them. We went to the district attorney's office. We said that our victim could no longer cooperate because they couldn't keep her family safe. The district attorney's office determined that that was reasonable uh, refusal to cooperate any further. They issued her the certification she's a lawful permanent resident. Um, had we gone through a different certifier, we would not have been able to get her status to the detriment of all of us. And just to follow on Carmen's point, the regulations in and of themselves build in this reasonable non-cooperation um, caveat, essentially, to because it's contemplated and understood that victims of crimes are, have a variety of issues that may make it unsafe or unreasonable to cooperate. And I think Carmen's example is certainly um, an extreme example, but I think there are daily kinds of uh, factors that impact our client's ability to reasonably cooperate with law enforcement. And I will say that that, that kind of um, exception has really not been utilized by, by most agencies within this city. And that conversation that we've tried to have with, with certifiers as to that point has been met with a lot of resistance. The, the interesting thing to note, um, Council Member, is that the, the statute that created the relief itself considers that mere helpfulness in detection of crime is sufficient helpfulness to issue you certification. So effectively, calling the police should suffice to issue you certification. And if the interests of the city are to improve cooperation and collaboration between immigrant communities that are living in daily fear in New York right now under the current administration um, and law enforcement, it would behoove us to ensure that the certification process is as expansive as possible under the statute. So my attorney reminds me, Sebastian McGuire, that these were issues that we actually brought up during the rulemaking process. And um, how much, I mean, I don't think they adopted uh, many of the suggestions. Can you reflect on that a little bit? The NYPD, so um, in fact, they have made small modifications to their um, process based on our comments during rulemaking for their use cert and T certification issuance um, regulations. Um, but uh, they didn't go to the meat of our, um, our commentary. For one, they didn't address the criminal background issue, which we have been advocating um, for, for at least a decade now. Um, they have not addressed the fact that they still require individuals to go and pick up certifications in person. Um, you know, some of us uh, work 14 hour days already and um, finding those two or three extra hours to pick up these certifications are kind of, is kind of difficult. They didn't uh, address the fact that we can't mail certification, email certifications to the NYPD, that we have no way of communicating with the, the, the person, really there should be one person that makes, that pulls the files, makes certifications, um, and make, uh, makes ref, uh, certification recommendations. That was not addressed. They have created kind of back room measures to, a, to address some of these issues. And I have to say, I mean, just really from where we started 10 years ago, it's like night and day. And they really should be, uh, you know, um, praised for that. Um, but that, yes, you, Sebastian would be right in that uh, many of our recommendations were not addressed. Okay, thank you. A uh, last question, and uh, we have two more panels that we want to get through. And and just a heads up to all the folks that are coming. I I want I want to uh, uh, get away from the written statements and really kind of hear you kind of address some of this conversation, so we can continue to have a conversation. But I'm really interested in in the DA's relationship with the advocates and really thinking about how you reach out to the DAs, how the DAs reach out to you. You know, we want the DAs to change the policy of waiting until criminal case ends to issue you visa certifications. You know, that way the NYPD could actually issue a certification even if a criminal investigation is ongoing. 
Um, I think that's the, it feels like that's the goal. Um, it, can anyone speak to that in kind of clear terms and give us an idea, a roadmap to engage the district attorneys? So I think, you know, I think with the district attorney's offices, it's really borough specific um, in terms of our experiences and the kind of dialogue that has happened throughout the, the last decade, I guess, that we've been working on these issues. Um, the, the issue of NYPD not certifying while a case is pending seems to be an issue between the NYPD and the DAs. There's no, no reason why the NYPD cannot certify while a criminal prosecution is pending. Can, you, can I pause you right there? Yeah. What is the issue that NYPD said? Because they had an issue today. How, how, I, do you, how, how would you define the issue? I don't think they've actually articulated the issue. I believe there is, there is some kind of, um, I don't want to say conflict between the NYPD and the DAs, but there's, there's some disagreement or uh, pressure about the NYPD not doing that while a criminal case is pending. And those are issues that may need to be worked out between those, the, 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 the DA's offices and the NYPD, but as advocates, we don't see anything legally that would prevent the NYPD from certifying. The regulations say you have been helpful in an investigation or prosecution, and so it allows... Right, so let me, let me pause there, because I think we've, we've already said that, but, and so thank you. Yeah, yeah. The question, or the, the, um, the point here is that, well, there's multiple points, but the one point I want to make here is that if we rely on the DA and the NYPD to figure this out, it's not going to happen. I, I just, this is, we're going to go in yeah. circles. So I'm trying to figure out what the pressure points are here, and one of them is clear. Legally, they can do it. And so I just want to continue to go back to that and figure that out and say, legally, they can do it. Why are they not doing it? What's preventing them from doing that? And that's really pressure from the DAs. So what I'm trying to unveil here, reveal here, is your relationship with the DA's office and trying to figure out where, where there might be cooperation, uh, in, engagement, or uh, one DA that kind of sticks out and says, you know what, I think we can work with him to kind of reshape and pressure all the other DAs to do. We're working on so many different things here already with DAs, and we'll go into that. I'll pause here. Carmen. So I think it might be helpful just to preface what's actually happening behind the scenes when an individual is arrested. So uh, arguably, the role of the NYPD ends at the time that the case is transferred to the district attorney's offices. They then do their own internal investigation and press charges. We will go to the NYPD, and, and we've been kind of reasoning this out with them for years. Their role, as far as we're concerned, is over when the case is referred, and so they should be able to certify at that point, even if they wanted to wait until their investigation were over to certify. When that case is transferred to the district attorney's offices, the district attorney's offices, in the course of prosecuting their case, have a legal responsibility to update defense counsel um, if there is certain, if, if they, uh, there is anything that they ha do with the victim that could possibly be seen as giving the victim a benefit. Um, and they need to update counsel. It's, it's the law. And if they don't do so, it endangers their investigation. And so what our understanding is from prior conversations with the district attorney's offices and with NYPD, in part during the um, meetings that Moya organized for all certifiers, is that there doesn't seem to be a way for NYPD to update DA's offices with reliability as to whether or not they issued a use certification. And the district attorney's offices have to be able to know that use certification was issued because they need to inform defense counsel. And so if we can fix that lack of communication, that may go very far to issuing a certification. Now, from, I think, the, the advocate's perspective, it might be as simple as making a phone call. Um, that might also fix the delay that we find when we go to NYPD to issue use certification and they deny because they've arrested the person and then we have to restart again from with a district attorney's office's office at the back of the line for their certification. So for example, a number of years ago I had a case where my client was assaulted by her abuser. The, the police were unable or unwilling to arrest him. The I filed a use certification. The case went to case review and after a conversation uh, with supervisors, they sent someone to arrest him. A use certification request was already pending by NYPD. 
for months. They arrested the guy, they had to deny based on their policy, and I had to restart again with the Bronx DA's office, which doesn't certify until the end of an investigation. My client spent three years without use certification living in a homeless shelter. That could have arguably been fixed if NYPD, upon arrest, were to send notification to the Bronx DA's office that they've issued a use certification and issued the use certification. That really could be the fix. And also, just to follow up, I think NYPD's other issue was the idea of the ongoing helpfulness, and I think that the, the suggestion that Carmen is, is framing kind of serves to alleviate that particular issue because in the same way, the DA, if they needed to update the NYPD that there had been a lack of cooperation, the regulations allow for certifiers to revoke, when necessary, a U certification. So there are all there are sort of these built-in safeguards to the regulations and, and for all of these reasons, it is why we are saying that the NYPD should be exercising their discretion broadly, not trying to, to um, and, and to encourage them to issue certifications in more broad circumstances rather than limited. Thank you. This was incredibly productive and eye-opening, and I think it gave Councilmember Drum and I some ideas on how to move this forward from the council side, from the committee side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next panel, we have Ms. Terry Lawson from the Bronx Legal Services, uh, Shani Adas, the New York Legal Assistance Group, Amanda Durashaw, Her Justice, and Joy Sigweed from the Urban Justice Center for Domestic Violence Project. Reminder, let's, let's try to stick to three minutes, and um, I'll ask you to wrap up after three minutes, and uh, we, ha we have your written testimony, so we'll review that. If there's anything that you can add to this conversation to really kind of push these points that we've been uh, making throughout this conversation, and who would like to start? Thank you. I can start. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Terry Lawson. I am with Bronx Legal Services, the Bronx Office of Legal Services NYC, and I'm also here on behalf of the Bronx Immigration Partnership, which is a collaborative of local organizations and agencies working together uh, for Bronx residents. I would like to spend my time highlighting some of the best practices that we've observed in New York City agencies that handle these requests and to encourage other NYC certifiers to adopt similar practices. It should be as easy for a pro se person to seek a U and T certification as it is for someone who has a lawyer. New Yorkers become easy prey for notarios, an issue I know that this council cares very much about, and other bad actors who charge, frankly, thousands of dollars for certifications that people could get on their own if they had access to the right information. These be best practices put people without a lawyer on the same footing as those with legal representation. First, each NYC certifier should provide clear descriptions of their certification procedures on their office's websites and in public locations, and that information should be translated into the multiple languages on the nyc.gov website. Second, each NYC certifier should adopt a reasonable time frame for adjudication of certification requests, ideally 30 days, and should include an appeals process, as my colleagues have said. Third, all denied requests should provide detailed information about why the request was denied to allow the requester an opportunity to respond appropriately and should lay out the appeals process in that notification and the description of the appeals process should be provided in the language of the requester. Fourth, NYC agencies should allow the submission of certification requests by U.S. mail and by email, should acknowledge when a re request has been received and should create follow-up procedures that allow requesters to be in touch via email and by telephone and ideally by text message because that's how people communicate these days with the office responsible for signing the certification. Fifth, certifiers should mail certification responses to the requester unless the requester asks for the opportunity to pick up the certification in person. Sixth, Agencies should sign certifications even when a case is pending based on the cooperation, cooperation that has already been provided. Given how long it takes for some cases to be adjudicated, especially in the Bronx, 
there should be no requirement that a case or investigation be concluded before certification can be signed. We encourage the City Council, Moya, and the new interagency task force to work with New York City agencies that have not made their certification procedures public and to include the NYC Department of Education, the CCRB, Internal Affairs, the Department of Corrections, and the NYC Law Department um, in conversations to develop their certification uh, procedures. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, members of the committee. My name is Joy Zigwide. I'm the supervising immigration attorney at the Urban Justice Center Domestic Violence Project. Thank you on behalf of my colleagues and our clients for this opportunity to appear and speak before you today. We're grateful for your support of the organizations that work with the immigrant community to improve life in our city for all New Yorkers. At DVP, we consider domestic violence in any type of intimate partner relationship, regardless of gender identity or sexual orientation, to be a human rights violation. And in the course of our work with non-citizen survivors of violence, we frequently encounter clients who may be eligible for U or T non-immigrant status. We advocate with many of the city agencies here today and mentioned here today to obtain law enforcement certifications that will allow our clients to apply for UNT visas. And we're grateful to the city agencies who already certify and who are in dialogue to improve their certification procedures. Um, I join in my colleagues here today in offering recommendations to improve, further improve the process of UNT certifications in our city so that all eligible survivors in New York are able to apply for immigration status in a timely fashion. As Terry mentioned, establishing clear, transparent, straightforward processes that are accessible to attorneys and pro se requesters is essential to ensuring that immigrant victims of crime are not further preyed upon by notarios, fraudsters, and unethical lawyers. Far too often we encounter clients who have already paid huge sums of money to someone promising to get them a U visa certification. Just a couple of weeks ago, I met with a domestic violence woman, a domestic violence victim, a woman who is barely making ends meet, trying to support her children, who paid $1,300 to someone falsely claiming to be an attorney so that he would request a U certification for her. He made the request to the Bronx District Attorney's Office. As Terry mentioned, the Bronx DA does not certify until cases are closed, so the request was sort of pointless at that point. And then he would not follow up later um, because she could not pay additional money. Um, she's now our client, but she lost hundreds of dollars to a fraudulent service provider, and she still had no idea how the process actually worked. So the heart of these recommendations um, is a belief that there needs to be consistency so that the process is easy for people with attorneys and without attorneys. Um, I completely concur with all recommendations that uh, previously stated, and in the interest of time, we'll just reiterate quickly. Certification requests should be accepted by email in addition to regular mail um, to make it faster, more efficient, and cost effective. Agencies should set forth clear timeframes for adjudications and for appeals so that survivors do not remain indefinitely in limbo. Agencies should mail signed certifications to the immigrant or her attorney rather than requiring that certifications be picked up in person, um, thus conserving limited resources of legal service providers and minimizing time off from work for immigrants. Finally, post current detailed certification procedures online. Others have testified today about the need for a public, a public awareness campaigns and public education, um, information about T and U certification processes for all agencies should continue to be centralized on a city website, but that information should be detailed, um, outlining each agency's specific requirements, both for pro se and represented up. requesters. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Amanda Dorisho and I'm a staff attorney at Her Justice, a nonprofit organization that uses a pro bono first approach to deliver legal services. We partner with New York's finest law firms to deliver free quality legal services to low income New Yorkers who identify as women in the areas of family, matrimonial and immigration law. Last fiscal year, Her Justice assisted over 3,000 individuals with their legal matters. We appreciate the opportunity to speak today to the City Council about best practices relating to the U, um, issuance of UNT certifications. Many U certification requests from city agencies currently take six to 18 months to process. These delays are excessive given the current climate of immigration enforcement in which the lives of undocumented New Yorkers who are crime victims are at serious risk of upheaval and devastation. Many times, the URT visa provides the only legal, me legal mechanism by which many of our clients will be able to stay in the United States. 
These delays can be even longer, up to two years or more, when an indiv individual, individual is involved in the criminal legal system. As we've been speaking about earlier, this delay is largely due to the NYPD practice of refusing to certify and issuing denials when the suspect has been arrested and then referring it to the relevant district attorney's office. District attorneys often refuse to certify when a criminal case is pending and criminal cases often take two years or more to resolve. As advocates, we know when um, ever an arrest is made to not even go to the NYPD because they will issue a denial and then refer it to the relevant district attorney's office. In addition, each district attorney has a different protocol for issuing certifications that give clients arbitrary results depending on the borough where they live. A two-year delay is too long to wait for a certification and puts many people at risk of harm. By the time the criminal case has resolved, the victim may already be detained by immigration, may be facing deportation, or may have already been deported from the U.S. Therefore, it's best practice for the NYPD to sign you to certification requests even when the suspect has been arrested. Nothing precludes the NYPD from issuing a certification in these instances. Cooperation in the detection and investigation of the crime is all that is needed for the NYPD to certify, and there is no requirement that the investigation be completed before a certification can be issued. There's also no requirement that um, the victim cooperate both with the investigation and the prosecution. Several police departments around the country actually issue you certifications when there has been an arrest when the victim does not want to participate in the criminal prosecution. Long delays in the issuance of UNT certifications also make our clients more vulnerable to explo um, exploitation to unscrupulous immigration advocates, has just been said. Some clients with long pending certification requests have told us that they have hired attorneys or non-attorneys who falsely promised to expedite these requests, and then the clients have paid vast amount of money to do so. You Thank can you. Wrap. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Shawnee Adess, and I'm a supervisor at the New York Legal Assistance Group. My testimony is going to jump to the parts that haven't been covered, um, but, but the premise is that we need, one, written publicized policies, which has already clearly been explained from all certifying agencies, which does not exist. We need implementing practices that enable requesters who are denied certifications an opportunity to appeal such denials and a delineation of a method to request expedited review in urgent cases. Training certifiers who are reviewing cases and collaboration with local immigration, immigrant legal service providers is necessary to ensure that best practices are used when creating these policies and when conducting trainings of certifiers, which uh, happens with inconsistent rates. Um, every policy that's written up should address the process to request the certification, the processing time for certification requests, a clear appeals process in the case of denial, a method to request expedited review, and a designated person or point of contact if there is an issue with the implementation of these written policies. For the purposes of the testimony that's happened before, I'm just going to focus on the appeals process and a little bit about training. Um, each agency needs to have an appeals process if an initial request for certification is denied. At this time, only one certifier in New York City has a method to appeal, in the, in, um, which is the NYPD. They established this process in 2016, um, after which they determined that 20, 48 cases that were denied in 2015 were then approved once that appeals process was started, and I don't have the numbers for the most recent year at this time. Without an appeals process, there would have been no way to remedy 48 incorrect denials. When you take into account these 48 people, plus people that have been denied by many other courts, district attorneys, and certifiers, we're talking about a large number of people that could have been eligible for relief if they had been given a means to actually advocate, provide context, or respond and contest some of the reasons for which the certification was denied. That goes to the other point that an appeals process is, to a certain degree, moot if there isn't a clear basis for the denial provided to the requester. Um, it was already testified by the prior panel that when we don't have clearly articulated reasons, we're working in the dark and we're using up a lot of resources. That being said, we're lawyers. We can do that. We do this work all the time. We've been doing it for a long time. But what about that pro se individual? What about that pro bono that's taking this case and it's their first or second case that they're doing on a use certification request? They certainly wouldn't be able to do that. Um, 
In terms of how to respond to the process as a whole, I would just note that directed trainings in coordination with advocates is the only way to, sort of, to check the process that's happening and to ensure that hopefully the appeals process isn't even necessary in the future. Um, and I'll end my testimony there. Thank you to the panel. Councilmember Drum. Uh, so the only question that I have at this point for this panel, and I'm really excited about this concept of across the board appeals process and then most, the most recent kind of recommendation about working with, aid, with the certifiers to create training process. Does that exist today? Do you partner up <clears throat> with training at all right now? Um, there is some agencies that, um, and I'll point to the NYPD in particular, who have set up meetings with um, legal advocates, with uh, some of the people that are involved in the different parts of the process um, in order to get feedback from us on things that are going wrong, our concerns, things that have been going well. Um, but we do not do trainings. Our understanding is that with NYPD, most trainings happened at roll call, so I'm not sure what the implementation would be. Um, but to my knowledge, there has been no recent formal training provided to the people that are doing certifications. And there's been a lot of turnover at every agency in terms of who is evaluating these um, certifications. So it's certainly necessary, especially for crimes that aren't domestic violence. That's a great, we're gonna follow up on that. And, and uh, Councilmember Jerome brought up the NCOs, the Neighborhood Coordination Officers, and I think that'll be a great opportunity for us to work on the, on the local level. There's so much access there right now, and they are, taking I, every idea and running with it. So if you're open to it, and I'm kind of opening it up to the entire room, uh, let's start there. Let's see how far we go before the wall, if anything comes up. Um, and let's, let's just move. This is a great place to move and see how far we go without, without any kind of formal um, requests and then just let the, the nature of this work uh, move us. Council Member, if I could, yes. I would just add that um, it would be helpful to work with agencies that are already training judges, um, because there's a lot of work that's already, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, um, and we could certainly train them as well, but there's already curriculums in place to train judges that have been developed, so we could certainly um, work together. Thank you. We'll be following up with you on, on that too, and, and everyone else that might have access to um, training documents. Thank you. Thanks to this panel. And our final panel is uh, the City Bar Justice Center, Suzanne uh, Tarn Tarnator. Sorry. I'm going to blame it on me and not your, the writing. <laughs> New York City Bar Association, Deborah Lee. The Urbis Urban Justice Center, Aline Q. The CUNY Law School. Raquel Batista. This is our final panel. Uh, we'll take your three minute focused um, areas that we might not have covered, um, new ideas and responses to something you might have heard from the administration or other colleagues. Uh, and we'll offer a few questions and then I'll make my final thoughts and we'll conclude this hearing. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Suzanne Tamator and I'm the co-director of the Immigrant Justice Project at the City Bar Justice Center. The City Bar Justice Center is the nonprofit legal services arm of the New York City Bar Association. And just for clarification, our immigration committee is actually also providing testimony on some different points. But the Justice Center is the nonprofit legal services arm of the association. And annually, we provide legal education, information, advice, brief services, and direct legal representation to more than 20,000 low-income and vulnerable New Yorkers from all five boroughs of New York City who would otherwise be unable to access the legal services they need. Our clients include immigrants, battered women, veterans, LGBTQ individuals, homeless families, seniors, cancer patients, and survivors, consumers filing for bankruptcy, homeowners facing foreclosure, struggling small businesses, and others. I would like to thank um, Carlos Menchaca and the Committee on Immigration, um, including Daniel Drum, for drawing attention to the important issues of human trafficking and immigrant crime victimization in general. While New York City has shown great strides in these, uh, in these areas, um, a lot of uh, points have come up today 
um, to highlight the importance of, of these issues, um, just to add a, a, a few additional points in, in the interest of time, I'm going to be skipping a lot of the written testimony. Um, I've done a lot of work over the years on human trafficking in particular, and there have been a lot of very good um, public awareness campaigns in that area. Uh, the federal government has really um, driven some of that, and uh, New York City has also done various campaigns over the years. However, there's been no public awareness campaign on U visas and, and for other immigrant crime victims to access this immigration relief. And as Commissioner Herman mentioned from NYPD, um, most of their requests are from survivors of domestic violence, and that is because we have great domestic violence advocates here in New York City and the Family Justice Centers and whatnot, but there's many other individuals who are victims of other crimes who really have no idea about accessing this relief. Um, this is also very, would be very timely because with DACA most likely ending um, and TPS ending for Haitians, um, and, and unfortunately probably for other um, other recipients of TPS coming up, um, it would be, you know, really timely to consider something like this. Um, it's already been mentioned that information should be posted in public spaces on access to UNT status. Um, I think it would be amazing if city agencies and NYPD had a general crime victims' rights brochure that had information about victim compensation, legal services, as well as um, eligibility for U or T status. That could be also provided um, through public hospitals and in many languages that are commonly spoken by New Yorkers. Um, I'll wrap up. Um, finally, you know, training has been mentioned. Um, ACS has a really robust training on a training series on human trafficking that I think um, is open to other child protective services agencies, but perhaps could be opened for other um, certifiers around the city and expanded um, to include youth certifiers. And finally, certifiers should have sufficient resources to respond to requests in a timely fashion. Um, I think it's been said, but you know, having people wait to access immigration relief when the backlogs with the federal government are so long already as it is, um, any way we could help people assert their rights um, faster and with more transparency is appreciated. Thank you. Great. Uh, my name is Deborah Lee. I'm a member of the Immigration and Nationality Law Committee of the New York City Bar Association. I'm also a senior staff attorney with Sanctuary for Families, and I work at the New York City Family Justice Center in Brooklyn. Um, with over 24,000 members, the City Bar has a long-standing mission to equip and mobilize the legal profession to practice with excellence, promote reform of the law, and advocate for access to justice in support of a fair society. The City Bar and its committee have long advocated to increase access to quality counsel for anyone in need, including immigrants who have been impacted by crimes, domestic violence, and trafficking. The City Bar and its committee commend the City Council for holding, holding this hearing today, and we thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, Immigrant victims of crimes and trafficking uh, provide critical information to agencies seeking to investigate and prosecute cr criminals and traffickers in our community. It is in the interest of our entire community's public safety, as well as in the interest of justice, to do whatever we can to ensure the cooperation of any victim of crime or trafficking, regardless of their immigration status. Um, as has been mentioned before, in our current political climate, immigrants are more vulnerable than ever. Last week's decision by the Trump administration to rescind deferred action for childhood arrivals early next year highlights how vulnerable non-citizens' rights and protections are to political whims. With so few avenues to permanent status available under federal immigration law, it is imperative that local governments do everything in their power to assist individuals who are eligible for relief. Given this, we encourage the city to redouble its support of immigrants by providing more accessibility to UNT certifications. First, the city should encourage more public awareness, as has been mentioned again and again today, um, about immigrants' victims' eligibility for UNT visa certifications. Additionally, it should help develop more transparent procedures, again, as has been mentioned earlier today, citywide for New York City agencies, courts, and law enforcement. Knowledge empowers immigrants and those advocating on their behalf. Immigrant victims of crimes and trafficking need to know what U and T visas are so that they can learn if they are eligible to receive certifications from local agencies 
and they need to know how to apply for these certifications. Attorneys, both those in the nonprofit legal services community as well as those in the private sector, and in particular, those who may be less seasoned than the experts that have testified already today, need to know how to advocate on their client's behalf to uh, apply for these UNT visa certifications. There needs to be clear procedures, again, as has been mentioned before, appeal procedures and standards that are publicly available for all members of our community um, by each of the agencies that are capable of certifying immigrant victims um, of crimes and trafficking. Thank you again for your support um, of immigrants and immigrant victims of crimes and trafficking. Good afternoon, my name is Aileen Gay. I am the Immigrants' Rights Paralegal at the Community Development Project at the Urban Justice Center. CDP's mission is to strengthen the impact of grassroots organizations with organizers in New York City working with low-income and other excluded communities. At any given time, our seven practice areas work with between 60 and 70 grassroots organizations across the city. Um, and most of our resources go to working with immigrant New Yorkers. Um, so CDP appreciates the opportunity to talk today about best practices, and we believe that it is crucial at this moment to broaden the accessibility of existing immigration remedies by eliminating unnecessary hurdles to you and T visa eligibility. And my testimony today will focus on uh, the need to protect immigrant tenants and workers being victimized by abusive um, landlords and employers. So since November's election, uh, we have seen an, an uptick in the number of reports from tenants and workers experiencing abuse um, at the hands of their landlords and uh, employers. Landlords and employers very well know that any threat to call ICE at this particular moment can be a really effective tool in silencing tenants or workers. Uh, we want to uh, commend uh, the New York City Commission of Human Rights for its leadership as the first anti-discrimination agency in a major U.S. city for providing U visa certifications. And one of our first cases uh, for U visa certification issued by the commission was awarded to one of our clients who we'll call Sophie um, and another group of tenants in her building. And in Sophie's case, the landlord hired agents to harass her on a nearly daily basis to intimidate her into accepting a really unfair um, buyout agreement. Um, and then when she refused, uh, they hired a security firm and threatened her with deportation and possible arrest. At the same time this was happening, the landlord started renovations that virtually made the buildings inhabitable. They had um, no access to gas and hot water for weeks. With the help of our attorneys, Sophie and her neighbors uh, reported the landlord's actions to the commission and the commission interviewed these uh, tenants with great sensitivity um, and issued U visa certifications on their behalf. We have since submitted those U visa applications to USCIS. We believe that the New York City Housing Preservation and Development, the Division of Housing um, and Community Renewals Tenant Protection Unit, to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the Department of Buildings Environmental Control Board are also well posed to uh, well poised to certify in cases like Sophie's. I'll wrap up there. Hello, um, my name is Raquel Batista, and I'm the Community Lawyering Fellow at a CUNY School of Laws. Community Legal Resource Network. And we work in collaboration with Voces Latina and Queens Legal Services and a number of pro bono law firms in representing both documented and undocumented immigrant women in their VAWA, U, and T visa applications. And so I'm not gonna go into my testimony, but I just wanna highlight specifically in the NYPD report 
um, they did include numbers from the district attorney offices across the boroughs. And I did call NYPD to ask them specifically which numbers corresponded to which boroughs. They did not share that information. Um, I think that that's something that would be really, really helpful in terms of when working with uh, local nonprofits like Voces Latinas in Queens, it would be really helpful to know which numbers correspond to which boroughs. Um, and maybe that's a FOIA request, maybe that's a phone call, but you know, it would be really helpful. And I also wanted to highlight um, California. California has a model, SB 674, the Immigrant Victims of Crime Equity Act of 2016, um, where the state enacted a law that requires state and local certifying authorities to respond to requests within 90 days. It also creates a presumption of helpfulness, meaning that unless there is evidence to the contrary, the assumption is that the immigrants applying for the visa were helpful in the investigation. And there is a USA Today news report that specifically um, talks about the impact of um, this legislation in California and how it's increased transparency, more cooperation between victims and law enforcement, improving overall community relations, but most importantly, preserving the right of undocumented uh, victims to pursue their rights and benefits. Um, so actually, uh, a few weeks ago, almost a month ago, Hispanic Federation also reached out to us um, to come up with some recommendations on this issue on the U visas. And so based on the California model and our own experiences, um, some of the recommendations that we have is one, to get guidance from the New York State Attorney General's office on the U visa certification process, a joint state and city task force on U visas, which include community and legal organizations, immediate update and report from all the certifying agencies on their approval denials and their criteria used, and um, that the city and state legislation address the issues of timeline, having a, a favorable uniform criteria, presumption of certification, and public annual um, quantitative and quali qualitative data reporting on the U visa certification request process. Thank you for those um, recommendations, those ideas, and for the entire panel. Um, I, we're gonna follow up with some of the recommendations that you have and requests for information. Today's, today's hearing kind of showed that we got more work to do on the transparency piece. But I wanna offer some final remarks as we close this, this hearing, um, but not the conversation. We're gonna have a lot more discussion and really focus on some recommendations. Today's hearing really proved a lot. One of those things is that the NYPD and the city is doing a really good job of moving the needle forward in bringing more transparency and fairness to a process that is not in our control. This is a federal government issue that will end in hopeful reform of the immigration laws. But the one thing for everyone at home to understand, that if you're listening right now, we just had a conversation about UNT visas. UNT visas for immigrants are sometimes the only way that they can get some form of status. The reason that the city needs to be so invested in this, even in a time where NYPD and the city agencies are doing better today for a fair and more transparent process, is that we can actually impact a lot more lives as a sanctuary city that's committed to protecting every New Yorker, even immigrants. This is a place that we can act. This is a place we've already been acting and we can demand more. This is an opportunity for us to also highlight some very serious things that are happening in our communities. Domestic violence is going up in our communities, especially in neighborhoods that I represent, for example, like Red Hook and Sunset Park. These are immigrant working family neighborhoods. Tenant harassment is going up. We've just heard from the advocates about how people are being harassed in their homes to be uh, either illegally evicted using construction as harassment or just using the fact of immigration status as a way to scare people out of their own homes. This is how we feel gentrification and displacement in our neighborhoods and we need 
a larger conversation about how we focus in this vulnerable community, and especially women and children. What is also unacceptable in this conversation that we just had today for me is bottlenecks in city agencies. That is unacceptable. We need to call it out. We need to identify it and we need to remove the bottlenecks, especially of ACS, for example, that's doing such a great job, is getting too much. We need to bring more resources to alleviate those bottlenecks. That was identified today. Also streamlining the process across agencies. For example, everyone should have an appeal process in this certification process. And the fact that NYPD has it, thank you very much. What prevents us from having an appeal process across the way? That is something we can do as a city. And I will also hold it as an unacceptable situation for the DAs and all the DAs and the NYPD to be broken in communication where a phone call could be the thing that changes the actual application process and moves the certification forward to protect another person. And why do we want to issue you and T visas? The spirit of this law, the spirit of our city is not only in sanctuary to hold um, our immigrant communities, uh, hold them together in our neighborhoods, but it's to have safer New York City. The helpfulness of people on the ground, whether you're an immigrant or not, is how we keep our neighborhoods safe. Making that connection about something that someone sees uh, and allow them to report either in a domestic violence situation at home or on the streets if they see something. We need everyone to engage in making our communities safer. The UT visas allow for that to happen and we need more of that. These bottlenecks and these issues that we have identified and the recommendations that you've all put forward are important for us to move. We need more public campaigns. IDNYC has proven that when we give good information out, know your rights sessions, when we give more information out, people respond, people are protected, and people know that their rights, that they have rights. So we need to figure that out. It might not be NYPD giving people an information like the Miranda rights, but we need to be able to get information out into communities and that trust that's being built by New York City advocates and communities, we can, we can elevate that. And finally, uh, the work that we do here is not just about keeping our communities safe. This is about giving people a certification from a city agency to put them into a federal process. And even before they get certification, a person in process can get access to state-funded health care, a work permit, and a deferred action and a deportation. That is the power that we're asking our city to focus on and give more people access to. That's how we hold the line on protecting our immigrants. And in a time where broken windows causes issues for NYPD because they have some criminal uh, uh, history of some sort, broken windows continues to be another issue that we need to address as a city council. Let's pass the Right to Know Act. Let's get, get police to, to begin a certification process that does not allow them to actually, um, and I forget how it was described, but have any discretion around criminal, the criminal history. That's how we end broken, broken windows policing for immigration and allow the UCIS process to be, because that's where they do criminal background checks, allow them to do that, not put the burden on us as a city. We as a city should be expanding rights, we should be expanding access to health care, we should be expanding access to deferred action and hold and keep our immigrants safe in our city. That is our responsibility. As the chair of the Immigration Committee, I'm ready to do that with you. Let's bring those, those models and let's get into our communities and get the word out. Thank you so much for this discussion. I'm really looking forward to working with you. Thank you so much for Indiana Porta, my council, and all the members, Councilmember Drum, Ku, and Eugene for being here today. Let's move this forward. This hearing is now done. Thank you.